All right, ladies and gentlemen, very rightly said, smart cities are not just about the technology. There are many more things that add up to the smart city. And now let's move on. And uh, our next session is on networked cities. Does improving cities' mobility network mean a complete overhaul of the system? Or does it just mean smarter use of existing systems by developing a better understanding of cities' movement patterns? improved signage and economical use of untapped inventory. To address these and many such questions and shed light on networks that matter, we have our next speaker, Colette Jeffrey. So ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Colette Jeffrey is Senior Lecturer in Gra Graphic Communication at Bur Birmingham Uni City University and a PhD researcher studying human wayfinding behavior. She's worked as a design director on wayfinding, information design, and inclusive strategy projects for Tower Bridge, Wembley Arena, the British Library, London 2012 Olympics and Paralympic Games. Ladies and gentlemen, not only this, she researched and co-wrote the official NHS guidance on wayfinding in hospitals. That's called Wayfinding Guidance for Healthcare and Facilities. It's a pleasure to have Ms. Colette here. So can we have a huge round of applause for her, please? Thank you. Hello. Um, <coughs> Lovely to be here. I'm going to talk about a, a different part of uh, smart cities that we haven't talked about yet, but I think it's equally important. Um, I work with architects. Um, my dad was an architect. I work with urban planners, and um, I'm going to try and avoid too much of that um, and just share with you some of the experiences I've had as far as getting lost in cities around the world. So this is talking about network cities. And if a city is networked, I think we'd all agree that it, it, is, it becomes smart. But what I've found is that if you're involved in the information design side of, of uh, finding your way, um, it's quite difficult. It's a very, very difficult challenge. Uh, even in just a, a quite a simple city that has a very sort of quite static layout. Um, and I am becoming more and more uh, aware that every city that I've worked in is different. And I think that's going to be the same. Uh, or I know that's the same here as well. So just three different bits that I'm going to talk about. What I know about getting lost in cities, I'm going to start with. Then I'm going to talk um, about how people find their way in cities from the research I've been doing. And that includes asking people who are living and working in India how they're finding their way. And um, just some thoughts on uh, the future of city wayfinding. So big question, Have, has everybody here been lost in a city? Hands up if you've never been lost in a city. OK, good. Uh, those of you that got lost, did you use a map to reorientate yourself? Hands up. OK, brilliant. Hands up if you asked somebody the direct for directions. Yeah. Okay. And this is where I'm going. So, I, so you know, I've spent 20 years designing signs, and I'm now having a, an, a, a, a second thoughts on the fact that we put all these signs in cities. And I think where my next move is, it's about artworks, it's about spaces, it's about landmarks, it's about things that can be described, and you and it doesn't move. If I send you somewhere and it's something that isn't there or it doesn't look like what you described, then it's not going to be helpful. Oh, went ahead one. So, some cities are lovely to get lost in. I'm not sure Delhi is one of those cities, so I decided to go for Venice. Anybody been to Venice? Beautiful city, you have the boundaries of the canals, you say, oh, there's the Grand, I'll just pop on this boat, and we had this wonderful time. My brother had been there for a week, so he just showed us around a bit. Uh, we shopped, we drank, we had some fun, and then we realized the last train was at 11 o'clock, and it was half 10, and my brother was going to show me, and suddenly it becomes this, like, stressful, horrendous, ah, oh, we're going to miss the train, we're stuck here. Um, and I had the map. And what you'll find is often the map is either too detailed or it's not detailed enough. So clearly uh, these were tricky. The one I had actually was illegible because it was pink with orange with yellow, low lit, in amongst all of these little places that looked exactly the same. And uh, so my husband got his, his iPhone out. We'll be fine. I've got a map. And he got the map out. And then we kept losing the signal. 
and we couldn't quite work out which side of the canal we were on. We would cover so. So it was really interesting experience as to how technology was wonderful. It did get us there because my map was useless, but it kept sort of making us more stressed and less stressed. It wasn't reliable. And you find, I mean, this is just a selection. You find uh, so many examples of where the technology, we saw it today, the lights went out to make you feel better. I organized a design conference in September at our university. The whole power went out and we didn't sort it out for an hour and a half. And everybody was presenting on a laptop, passing it around. So you, you were ahead of us. You got that sorted really, really quickly. That was good. Um, but yeah, there can be some real bad consequences for if people just follow technology and don't really think about um, using their brain. I actually have a brain I can think about where I should go. So we get lost in cities because they're always changing. Every city in every country is always changing in some way. And, and what, depending on what time of day it is, depending on uh, you know, whether you've been there before, has a massive impact. And your reason for being there, and this is where a lot of our, our um, design ideas come from a particular audience, a particular purpose. Uh, oh, my type is going a bit strange there. Anyway, so one of the projects I was uh, involved with and I wanted to share with you is uh, um, Legible London. Has anybody heard of Legible London? Well, we've won a couple of awards with it. It was a company that I worked with called Applied Wayfinding in London and basically was really pushing the idea that many, many people navigate London using the underground map and that isn't geographically accurate and you could easily walk between two places. So um, my boss at the time, Tim Fendley, created this whole map base of beautiful maps of London, put these um, wonderfully made, very high standard, very expensive sign systems around London. And they have really taken off. And there's lots and lots of them. And you'll find, you'll, you'll, hopefully you'll see them when you get a chance to get to London. You go, oh, there's one of those signs. Um, tell me what you think. What I was trying to find, uh, so the, the, sorry, the gentleman to the right there is uh, visually impaired. And a big part of my role was saying, so if I'm blind, I'm not going to use a map. What am I going to use? And so I um, developed an audio system so that it would describe if you, you're stood outside Selfridges on Oxford Street. To, to your left is this, to your right is that. Uh, it didn't really take off. Again, it's something that potentially needs. But linking him to my message proved to be really difficult. And there's all sorts of interesting problems that are arisen from uh, trying to sort out uh, connecting people and technology. And I think that's something to think about. And really the job there is just getting lost. I've been paid for 20 years just to get lost in cities. Go there, get lost, tell us what's wrong, come back and report it back. And generally it's about watching what people do. And I think that's the, the really sort of, you sort of got to put your assumptions aside go to the environment, go, what are people, or, or obviously, if, if it hasn't been created yet, anticipate based on what people do in other cities, in this case in India, in uh, other places in the UK. Second project, a very different city. And so this is where I'm touching on the idea that what you, whatever you are producing or thinking of producing needs to reflect or start to create a sense of place with the different cities. So this is Brightness, there's another UK city. With this one I took a real leading role as far as what should be on these maps, where should they be positioned, what colours they should be. And you can see from this compared to the London signs, it's, it's by the sea, it's a much more bright, colourful, it's on the south coast. Uh, we always have the sea line and the water, we had to come up with another colour for the water, you know, the water and the sea. And, the, and the, what do we call the front? So what we call things was a key part of what I was doing there. And what we created, and again, this is a, a standard diagram that Applied UK uses, um, is this selection of, of assets, I guess you could call them, things that help you find your way, depending on what sort of person you are, what sort of technology you like to use. And, but the, the important thing, and this links to what we just heard in that last uh, discussion, you have to have this map. None of this stuff will work if you don't have a really, really good base map. 
And that's what's lacking, probably. But the opportunities there, if you built this whole new city, you should have a decent base map. But you would be surprised. We've got a brand new university building. When I ask for base maps to start doing, tr trying out new technologies, you know, student-led in wayfinding systems, we go, oh, no, we haven't got a map. Well, oh, it's changed. All the rooms have changed. This is that. So that whole changeability of that base map is potentially the problem. And what they now have in Brighton, five years after doing that, is, is a quite disconnected system. And the, te and the maps that are on the street aren't exactly the same as the ones on the website, aren't the same as the ones on the, on the app. And, and their idea of interactive map, I was like, oh, they've got an interactive map, great, let's see what they've done. Uh, there's literally a little button, and you press on it, and it runs a video of somebody walking down the street, which uh, is sort of quite fine, but not that useful, really. I want to go and see it. And of course, this is one person's aspect of that seat, street at one time a day, and you know. So, I wasn't too impressed with that. You should be aware of the first project that this is all geared around was Bristol. So, a lot of people in the UK that are working in the the smart city wayfinding um, business um, worked on Brighton, and there's a lot been written about the Brighton, uh, uh, sorry, the Bristol, and also the legible London schemes. Um, so, if you wanted to know any more about that, just sort of look it up. But again. Five minutes, yeah. So loads of um, signs on the street. Uh, again, these systems, which I'm not convinced are right for a lot of Indian cities. So I'm going to move on. So one more thing, one more place to look at, one more example um, is New York. People been to New York? They have a similar problem. They need to get people walking. They need to get people out of vehicles. Um, 2011, 27,000 visitors surveyed, admitted to getting lost, being lost, fear of getting lost, or simply lack of knowledge leads to many people to use private or public transport rather than to walk. And so this is the underpinning side, and this is where the money gets generated to, to fund these sorts of systems. Uh, but again, does putting a sign on the street really help, or are you going to ask this man? He, st he stands there, he probably knows the local area, you think you're quite close, and you go, oh, I, you know, which is the way? What's, what's the way to such and such? And he'll point in whatever language. So are these systems, these integrated networked information systems right for India? Um, and so of course, in true fashion of a good information designer, I Google your different cities. So here's an example of uh, what Delhi comes up with, first page of a Google search. Here's one for Mumbai. Um, I'm very quickly getting a sense, oh, that looks a bit like that street in Brighton. But there's more of it, I, I'm not sure. Um, Chennai, so we st I'm starting to get a sense as to would this fit, how would it fit, um, would it not? I, even, I Googled you smart cities, and this is the image that the world gets when they Google smart cities um, in India. And so this is the fundamental thing. This is what I'd like you to remember, is that my approach to all of this comes from having written a book 20 years ago about how you find your way around a hospital. And I've now applied that to cities. And it works the same way. It's basic. It's simple. You've got these three interplay things. And if you have that in your head and you think, I can't just think about the information. I've got to think about the people. I can't just think about the environment. I've got to think about the information and the people. And if you start to think about all of those three, three things together, you're starting to get somewhere. I'm also a firm believer in asking people. Don't assume anything. Just ask people what they do. So I've been asking for the last couple of years, where did you get lost? What did you do? How did you find your way? And in the, the, a lot of these are places, they were in different countries, but these were people that were, were studying or working in the UK. 27% um, of them asked for somebody. We did have some using the signs. We did have some using the maps, but if you, um, group all those things together so at some point where somebody was involved, so you asked directions or um, you followed somebody is another strategy that I find, 50% um, used other people, only 44% used information, and then there's this 6% that are using environmental features. So I asked people living in India. I'm very lucky my uh, daughter has been working in Kerala, she has a group of people she works with, so I said, can you ask them what they do? when they try and find their way through a city in India. Um, and again, as I expected, I genuinely expected this, they're not going to be using signs, because I don't imagine the signs are very reliable at the moment. Um, they're going to ask somebody, rickshaw drivers, yes, taxi drivers, yes, in London we do that all the time, many, many places. It's a good strategy. Um, 
looking for big malls, looking for big buildings, landmarks. Um, Google, Google Maps in India is a bit in, inaccurate, so it would be my last resort. I wouldn't take his word for it. I would ask everybody here. I'd say, anybody, Google Maps, do you use it? Hands up. Good. So that is where this one person does, found it unhelpful, but they probably don't like technology. You know, so this is where you have to think about how the technology is right for people and the place. Um, so this is just a very, you know, I'm not claiming this is a study, I'm not claiming this is going to have the answers, but it starts to, to shift onto um, the difference in two cities. So in Delhi, Google Maps are easy to follow, but in Chennai they're less. Would you agree with that? Maybe, yeah. Um, so we have, the, again, this is, this is common. Some cities have been very well mapped. It costs money. It's difficult. It's hard. Uh, maybe when we know that the cars are going to crash into people if the maps aren't right, that might push this forward. Um, so how do we make wayfinding through cities in India easier and smarter? So these cities, every city is ever changing, um, but all wayfinding information needs to be quickly, easily, cheaply and simply updated, changed as those changes happen. That's really, really difficult in most cities. Uh, the, again, there might be some opportunity within a smart city. It's being sort of, you know, created. Um, but certainly, it need, you need to factor that in as to how you're going to change this information. It will need changing. Uh, landmarks. I'm becoming increasingly interested in how landmarks should be embedded into an, in the environment as it's being built. And your building should be describable and describable next, different to the next one. And the areas within that building. So my PhD is look, focusing on inside buildings and landmarks within those buildings. Um, and so thinking how it's, is it visible? Where do I head to? The man on the stall is gonna say, go over there. So how does he describe it? Um, and a landmark can't be frequently, cha frequently changing and moving. That, that doesn't make it a reliable thing for me to direct you through. Ma'am, uh, we have only another two minutes. Two minutes, thank you, that's fine. Um, so you need to ask people why they're there what they call things, so naming, absolutely fundamental. These buildings that I work in and when they, they say, oh, this is a working name. No, no, it needs to be a wayfinding name. It needs to be a name that I can find my way and it's different to another place. And it doesn't sound like it. It doesn't, when it's written down, it's different. Uh, when it's uh, on a sign, it looks different. Um, and ask people what information would help them and get that sense so the people that are finding their way in this particular city are more likely to do this or that or the other. And then uh, people have different wayfinding strategies, and that's, again, what my study and my, my experience is looking at, is how people find their way. It's fascinating. It's really, really interesting. And there's a mass of different uh, ways. So generally, you need this networked uh, piece of information. You need the information to be moving along in different technologies at different stages. People with disabilities uh, need to plan their journey much more, so they need information at home for planning. Uh, other people just leave and go, I'll be fine, and they then get their phone out. And so there's all sorts of um, different strategies. So three factors to think about, the people, the information, and the environment. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, so much, Ms. Jeffrey, for sharing your viewpoints with us. And ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Ms. Susan Zelinsky. Ms. Susan is the Managing Director, SMART, at the Transportation Research Institute, University of Michigan. Before joining SMART, Susan spent a year at Harvard Law Fellow focusing on new mobility, innovation, and leadership. And not only this, ladies and gentlemen, She's worked for over 15 years developing and leading transportation and livability policies and initiatives. She's advised on a range of local, national, and international initiatives, and was also a long-time uh, board member of Canada's Centre for Sustainable Transportation and founding board member of the Green Tourism Association. So ladies and gentlemen, can we have a huge round of applause, please, once again from Ms. Susan. Thank you. Hello, how are you holding up after such an intensive day? Okay, yeah, good. Okay, well, I'm really honored to be here. And uh, I have to say, uh, I grew up in the city that Jane Jacobs chose to live in um, and feel really lucky about that. But now I'm living uh, near the Motor City in the belly of the automotive beast in the US. 
So today I'm going to be talking about just one plot in the vast landscape of smart cities and smart society. Um, uh, but I think it's an important plot. Transportation is pretty important. Uh, and like Colette made the introduction to the whole transportation space. And it's also a plot that's thickening. So um, uh, I'm just going to, as we heard in the last panel, um, so I'm just going to, in the next you know, 15, 20 minutes, quickly give some context, then share a few tools for action, really practical tools for moving things forward in the, in the mobility space, and then end up with some logics that we gleaned through our kind of um, experimental journey in uh, trying to take a practical approach to, to new mobility systems. So just quick context, uh, Mediabyte, um, the way that I think about new mobility is that it's moving people, moving goods, and moving less in ways that are cleaner, greener, safer, healthier, and more equitable. So that's, you know, we call it mobility, but really it's not mobility, it's about access. And this came up today in different forms. It's really about meeting people's needs. How does mobility, it's a means to it, how does mobility help people meet their needs? And so it's, it's not for the sake of moving, and it's not about tweaking cars and calling it transportation. Uh, so I'm glad you've all had your lunch. Um, I'm going to talk about the whole enchilada, not just cars, but um, all modes, all services, technologies, products, infrastructures, um, not just about moving people, but goods and less. And, and less meaning things like telework, tele-shopping, um, reducing trips, eliminating trips altogether, or local production and distribution where you're do producing things locally, or even urban agriculture is in the mobility space. And if you think that, then what you're doing is you're opening up more innovation opportunities and you're opening up more things to connect with. Um, and then again, in terms of the players, not just government in the urban sense, not just big industry, um, not just NGOs, it's the whole um, enchilada. Um, so is there anyone who does not think that transportation is at a tipping point right now, either in India or globally? Who does not think it? Okay, good. We're on the same page. Um, so uh, just this is just a few visuals to warm up in terms of the, the tipping point aspect. Um, we have a prize. We created a prize thanks to the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, that was the, the subversive plot to crowdsource all of the different enterprises and, and businesses that are doing amazing things to make the world and cities a better place through transportation. And they are all, you know, services, products, technologies. And in order to, do, to create this platform that, where they could talk to each other and learn from each other, see what's out there, and actually connect with investors as well and, and city clients, um, we decided to have a prize so that they would actually fill out their, um, their profiles. But you get a sense here it's just so diverse and actually I find I look at this just to get more hope that there are so many things going on I think everybody here has experienced the huge explosion just in even the past few years I've been in transportation 30 years and I've never seen such change it's the stuff that we've been thinking about and wanting to see happen and partly that is because of technology helping but it's not because of technology taking over So this is the last one was a, quite a few things. In the, by the way, in the in the Mobi um, platform, about 23% are from India. So there was a huge response uh, from some of the in Indian innovation. Um, so what we know is that, that new mobility can and does play a catalytic role in transforming cities and economies, making them more resilient and sustainable, bridging the mobility divide. Hopefully, you know, if we do it right, and in driving an economic transformation. Now, I called my talk, um, We Are the Deciders, and that's the, that's the kind of theme I'm going to focus on, that um, I think in this situation where we're feeling a little bit like with the automated vehicles and even with the shared use and everything's IT-based, it might feel like the technology is outpacing the, the thoughtful policy and planning. And uh, so uh, it, the, the, the theme here is that actually we still have, technology has not yet taken over and we still have the capacity to actually decide how we want to live and then create the kinds of transportation systems that will serve that way that we want to live. And so that's why I'm going to be sharing some of the 
the tools that we're still working on. We love your help as well, or your thoughts on it. Um, but basically, um, looking at how uh, new mobility can um, evolve not just the great transportation systems, but also um, a healthy economy. So one of the challenges we found uh, in, we work around the world and we've, it's the same everywhere, there's four solitudes. The different uh, leaders of the um, innovations or even the ongoing transportation hardly ever get together. And then the loser, the, the, the user or the person loses out. Um, those things are hardly ever connected seamlessly in a way that's door to door, IT enabled um, um, and, um, and seamless. Um, so what we've, the, the three main areas we see um, happening, again globally, the three main things that are gaps in uh, transportation as it relates to cities or, or are needed are connecting the dots. How do you connect not only mode service product technology design but also the different leaders in the different sectors and um, even sort of the economic aspects of it. Um, second of all, moving the economy. How do we transform the economy so that it's supply industry supplies the sustainable and, um, and equitable types of um, services and modes and, trend and um, technologies. And finally, moving minds. How do we actually make transportation sexy? How do we understand what people want out of transportation and respond with innovations in that way? Um, so just a quick snapshot of SMART, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we work around the world. Um, SMART stands for Sustainable Mobility and Accessibility Research and Transformation, and it's a little bit backwards from a lot of university efforts in that it's not starting with research, it's starting with collaboration and working together with um, different city leaders and uh, industry leaders and entrepreneurs who need to see things change. And then the research and the education comes afterwards to advance the implementation of these whole systems, um, multimodal whole systems, and uh, to then work to accelerate the industry and enterprise that supplies them. So, um, Susan, sorry to interrupt, just another five minutes. Wow, that was quick. Okay, so. Um, the way that uh, we work uh, is, uh, actually I'm just gonna go straight to the, the methodology that we um, created with, uh, we started in India, uh, or we cut our teeth here, and I'm gonna skip the video even. Um, that went so fast. How many minutes? I thought it was 20 minutes, but never mind. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna skip through. One thing I do want to say is that um, we get the support of Ford Motor, so it's not just the city leaders and the planners that are that are really um, innovating here, and it's not just the Ubers and the disruptive entrepreneurs, it's actually big companies. So Ford Motor now has rethought itself. Um, over the 10 years we've been working with them, they've rethought themselves from car company into mobility solutions company. So that kind of thing um, was also, that uh, Ford Motor also supported our work in um, developing this methodology for um, connecting the dots and for leaders uh, um, developing uh, connected door-to-door -door transportation systems. Hang on just a second. There we go. So it's four steps. Um, and, and again, this, this we developed um, by muddling through, um, by working with, first of all, we were invited to India, and we thought we would stay in India, but then we were invited to um, South Africa, and then Brazil, sort of the, the World Cup cities. And then um, people got word of it, because um, there are so many cities that have a really great sort of um, transportation systems, but they, they don't connect all the dots. Um, so... Um, over time, we were, uh, we've done this in 20 different cities and it's, it's uh, um, developed into a four-step methodology that we've got down to one day. And um, it, it, it's really four simple steps. So the first is that we bring together people from all those sectors I mentioned. We um, identify some of the key desires. We first of all ask them, instead of saying what are the problems, we say what do you love about what's here? Which kind of, um, confuses people in transportation when you ask them what you like about, <laughs> about your city's transportation because it's hard to think about. 
And these are um, all the different sectors in the same room, which is really rare. Usually they're all doing stuff in the different places. From there, we take a simple map. We overlay absolutely everything that exists in transportation in that city. Um, you know, from the bike lanes to the um, auto rickshaw stands that are informal, from the taxi stands to the airports, every single transportation related thing is overlaid. And then we put a red dot where two or more things connect. And it's really magical to see all the different leaders from around the table um, saying, oh my goodness, you know, in Washington DC, the head of transit said, I didn't know so many of my bus stops already connected to Zipcar. And um, the head of uh, IT said, oh, we could actually take our great IT system and we could extend that to support um, taxis and to develop this whole comprehensive system that links with our traffic management. So it's a, quite a transformational um, uh, experience for all of them and the other subversive plot of it that we realized afterwards that because most of those people haven't ever really even met each other in the same region they get a chance to build their ecosystem and we're right now in a situation of you know technology outpacing policy so what that means I think is that we have to start learning to work well together across sectors and speak each other's languages. And so this is an amazingly simple and actually quite enjoyable process where you're with people you've never met, they have the same goals, um, you're, you're kind of reverting to your inner child because you're playing with post-it notes. And this happens a lot in the planning field, but it doesn't happen quite as much in transportation. And so you have um, a, a lot of opportunity to do a range of different, very localized solution. So this isn't about an official plan. It's about an, an infinite game. It's about continuing as we were hearing that this has to evolve. So this moves into even also being able to identify, okay, this is missing. An entrepreneur will say, oh, actually, I can, I can write an app for that, for that one thing in that area. You don't have to wait for two years for the official plan to be written and then everybody to agree on it and then feel that that's cast in stone. It's an infinite game. So this process we've had, um, we've had different cities come to us and say we want to put a car share or a bike share in, but we want to make sure it overlays with all the other stuff and it's very simple to set up invite the the diverse sectors make the map show where the connection points already are then develop key questions that are going to zero in on it's completely customized zeroing in on the particular things that you want to solve but it's extremely different when you're standing around the map with people from other sectors and you're beginning to develop your ecosystem so you know you can phone them or get in touch with them the next kind of project you have to do or the next um, challenge you have to address um, and then the other thing is that it's it's um, resulted in immediate action. So even giving out the map that's multimodal, and as we heard, you know, there are so few of them, even giving out that map, putting it online, is, is a real um, change, and you can do that immediately. You can also do things like, you know, move the taxi stand across the road under the lights uh, for the woman who's going to get off the bus after her night shift uh, nursing and uh, wants to get home in a safe way. Um, and then she also has her iPhone based um, um, app that helps her um, call the right kind of taxi immediately. So this set of integrated options, um, all of these things can happen, uh, they don't have to happen all together at once. The other thing is that it's a new capacity. We, we give out a certificate at the end, especially in Brazil, they love this because they feel like, okay, I've, I've spent this day doing this, I've learned how to do this. And this is something that we hadn't, we didn't know, we just kind of created it with everybody, all the different cities we were learning from as we went along. And the feeling that they can actually, I can run this myself, I can take this approach and then we can actually identify really giant things. When we did this with Washington DC, the director of planning who, who was our key contact there and brought in all these different players, um, she decided that de development was really important to her. Where were they developing? Where were they missing transportation? We saw huge gaps. She grayed out the parts that were going to be developed. And we were huge gaps in connectivity, not just in transportation, but in being able to link different modes together. Um, huge gaps and then there were 
were things where there was a lot of transportation but not too much going on. So um, it's, it's a really simple, practical, immediate thing that can be done before any project and um, has uh, multiple benefits. So um, I'm just going to flip from there. Um, these are some of the images from the different cities we've done this. Um, we did it in Brazil with um, the Federation of Municipalities, and uh, they represent the 4,000, the mayors and city managers of the 4,000 cities in Brazil. And uh, they're um, looking to link this with the kinds of um, plans that are required in order to get transfer funds, federal transfer funds. Um, so, and then I'm just going to end off, um, I had to go really, really quickly. Um, I do hope you'll um, look into the Mobi Prize and platform, uh, and if you know of any uh, other new mobility enterprises and you can share that, that would be great. But what I wanted to, do, to end off with um, <laughs> is moving minds. Um, so uh, one of the aspects of this is that you know we have we all have different languages, and uh, what we're finding is as we move from the old way of kind of we think of urban transportation as bricks and mortar and you know big infrastructure and capital funding and everything, but as that's changing um, and as it's on demand and we don't necessarily need to own anything, we can just use it all. Um, there are new decision models, and it's moving from. Um, deciding uh, between having one mode, it used to be one mode versus another mode, okay, car versus um, bus or car versus bike, and um, that polarity has shifted, and so that um, we have a lot of uh, research into how people think about how they make their decisions and what are the key factors in moving from single mode into whole system, and it's sort of like, you, you know, we move from typewriter into your laptop, desktop, printer, computer, all connecting with each other. I'm sorry, um, Susan, that's all the time that we have. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Um, I just want to just wanna do the last slide here. Um, last thing. Um, I, I was um, walking down the street with a friend who said, um, isn't it amazing how much Philip K. Dick um, predicted about the future? And Philip K. Dick is the guy who wrote the book that Blade Runner, the movie Blade Runner, this dystopic movie, was based on. And at that moment, I thought, oh, he did not predict. He actually created it. And I think by doing this work where we're actually moving forward ourselves, where we, in the, in the words of George Bush, you know, we are the deciders, and the we is a wide we. It's not just we the planners, it's not just we the, 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 the business, the entrepreneurs, not just we the CEOs. It's, it's also all of those plus citizens, and learning how to speak a new language, learning how to work with each other on systems that are very complex and very exciting. So um, with that, I'll say carpe diem.